Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Arbeta, and to the uh, our discussants, uh, Yusek Sambilia and Mr. Nilios. Um, welcome, everyone. I will be presenting to you today the results, or the highlights, rather, of the study that we conducted uh, for the ILG, which was um, um, pertained to the exercise of the PDP localization effort. Now, I could not have done this without the help of my co-authors, uh, Ms. Angel Faye Castillo, Ms. Rixi Banawin, and the assistance of Ms. John Camacho, as well as Ms. Lucy Melendez. So let me present to you today um, the local government's PDP SDG localization efforts as contribution to national development. All government agencies, instrumentalities, and local government units were mandated to implement the PDP and the Public Investment Program for the period 2017 to 2022, as mentioned by President Urbeta earlier. Now, the localization effort itself, which was initiated in 2018, aimed to first adopt a geographic-based perspective in planning and investment programming, second, to strengthen provincial oversight of these, and third, to strengthen provincial city-municipality interface, dialogue, and database management. Now, the DILG and NEDA introduced the policy of drafting the provincial and NCRLGU results matrices as an instrument or mechanism to enable and approximate extent of alignment of the local development investment programs to the PDP results matrices and the sustainable development goals. As national government agencies are preparing for strengthened devolution and oversight with the Mandanas ruling, this study can contribute to these efforts. Now, just to give you a bit of a background and a picture for those who are not quite familiar with the government planning framework. So this is the, this upper, in the upper left corner, gives you a picture of the, how the Philippine Development Plan, uh, where it's anchored on and what its priorities are included. So in drafting the Philippine Development Plan at the NEDA, of course, it's anchored on the Ambition 2040 long-term goal of the Philippines, but it also incorporates the administration social economic agenda. And this, is the, this happens always for, for each administration there to draft their own medium-term development plan. Now, in 2016, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals replaced the Millennium Development Goals, and the relevant um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals to the Philippines were also adopted and incorporated in the Philippine Development Plan. Now, the Philippine Development Plan contains the mission and vision of how the current administration sees where the government will be five years down the road. And in order to be able to bridge the gap to that vision from the current status, of course, you would have to have action. And these would be contained in the pro uh, programs, projects, and activities that are uh, prioritized in the Philippine Development Plan um, results matrices and the investment program. So the Philippine Development Plan results matrices contains the uh, measurable indicators that can help um, assess progress in the various uh, chapters of the development plan. I'll be showing you a summary later. And particularly for the specific indicators and uh, the outcomes and subsector outcomes that there are. Now, the NEDA also, apart from drafting this um, national results matrices, also drafted uh, regional results matrices, of course, and the regional development plan in order for um, it to be more location specific or geographic specific. Uh, in public sector theory um, of the local public good, this would actually refer to um, what you call the Thibault hypothesis, wherein um, localities will offer different array of goods and services of which voters will um, move to or vote with their feet to. So, so theoretically, if you put it back to the discussions on central decision and federalism, there would be different goods and services and priorities across different localities. And in the common literature, this is called the subsidiarity principle. So, so bottom line, it's anticipated that different regions would have different priorities, and this should be reflected in their development plans, as well as it should also be, um, be able to be monitored. So the data must be available for them to be able to construct this. Now, let me show you a summary of the chapters of the Philippine development plans that we looked at. I'll explain the process later on that was conducted at the DILG. Um, with the DILG efforts. Now, these are the 16 uh, chapters that 
have indicators in the results matrices. So you have chapter five, people centered, uh, clean, efficient, and effective governance ensured. Chapter six, swift and fair administration of justice. Chapter seven, Philippine culture and values promoted, and so on and so forth. Uh, I would like you to note that chapter eight here, economic op opportunities in agri and fisheries, repeatedly came around in the regional summary. So these were really priorities of the regions. Um, also would be chapter 10, which is human capital development. Um, uh, you would, I will be sharing with you later that um, uh, human capital development uh, came out in, one of, in most of the top three across the regions as a priority in terms of the number of indicators. Now, for some regions, Chapter 11 was very crucial. Vulnerability of individuals and families reduced, as well as Chapters 19 here, which is the safe, efficient, reliable, cost-effective, and sustainable infrastructure facilities and services that are used by the population, and Chapter 20, ecological integrity ensured, and the social economic condition. So for each of these chapters, we have um, outcomes that and subsector outcomes that we want to be able to, that the plan uh, aims to achieve. Um, and this is, excuse the very heavy graph, but um, this shows you how it, how the exercise was done in terms of the PDP localization effort. So uh, the provinces were asked to choose which indicators and chapters were relevant for their own provinces and draft a results matrix based on this. So in this case, I'm just showing you the example of chapter five, ensuring people-centered, clean and efficient governance, of which the subsector outcome is people-centered corrupt free and transparent governance practice, of which the subsector outcome one would be accountability and efficiency in governance measures improved. So that's, those are the objectives in the first column. Now in the second column, provinces were asked to choose from the shopping list, okay? Which of the indicators were appropriate for their particular provinces? And I'd like you to note that in the case of um, the indicators, there were there are 155 sustainable development goals indicators of which 68 of these are in the pdp rm of which 33 of these are available according to international definitions at the provincial level okay this has importance later on when i share with you the rather odd uh, summary of um, indicators now in the case of the psa they also identified the core regional indicators about 98 of these of which 71% of these were available at the provincial level. So this also has uh, implications later on. But apart from these, uh, local governments were also allowed to identify their own indicators. So you, we will see a, a great variation in the average number of indicators per region. The report, I did not include anymore today the report on the provincial because it's about uh, uh, oh, almost 90. Okay, LGUs, but it's in the, the discussion paper. So in any case, um, for the shopping list of indicators, let's say um, for this one, the first one would be under accountability and efficiency, the percentage of LGUs complying to the full disclosure policy. Okay, so ideally the local government was supposed to tick or, or fill up this particular, um, these particular columns if this was aligned with the SDGs of the Philippines and what the indicator source was. So that was also a challenge when we were summarizing the data. But ideally, there should be baseline information. So it was 2017 that was um, implemented, and then there would be the value of the indicator. And then there would be annual plan targets, 2018 to 2022. And then there should be the end of plan target. And then here I identified the various sources of um, data for this. So this is what provinces um, did back in 2018. They had to draft the results matrices. Now, to also give you a bit of a background on the planning and budgeting framework or where the local government is situated in the national development planning, this is the result also of a, study, a 2019 study of ours. And it shows you here, let's just focus first on the top and on the bottom. On the top, you would see, as in the earlier slide, ambition in 2040 is perceived to be the vision, the long-term goal of the country, so it's uh, the development plans are um, supposedly anchored on these. Now, <clears throat> in the bottom row here, that's shaded in green. Okay, this this was the focus of one of our studies in 2020, the baseline study on fiscal and governance gaps, <clears throat> wherein we surveyed 1,373 municipalities 
to look at their practices and development planning to identify both infrastructure and governance gaps. So at the local level, the process would be the municipal the municipality would develop their own development plan and they would um, identify uh, programs, projects, and activities that would be prioritized in their local development investment program, which is valid for three years, so it covers three years, which should actually be broken up into an annual investment program. So they would prioritize in the first year of this LDIP, what do we want to accomplish? Is it to, to build a hundred, uh, a, a one kilometer of road, or is it to build a level two water system or what have you. So it should find its way to the annual investment program, which finds its way to the local budget, which is a budget ordinance. <clears throat> so that would be the local process. Now, where does it fit in in the national development planning process? Well, if you look at the column instead, so let's focus on the first column here. The first column shows you the Philippine development plan, which is um, the double arrow iterative. Uh, there would be inputs from the ambition not in 2040, but there would also be current administration inputs here as well. So the Philippine Development Plan, which is downloaded, or um, which regional um, NEDA offices identify which priorities are applicable to their region. I, I would rather say it that way. So, so there's also a regional development plan. Now, the exercise that was conducted recently, the localization effort, actually pertains to this link between the provincial development plan and the regional development plan. And this is really um, legally under the purview of NEDA, under the regional development councils of NEDA. So, so that's what you have here. The current localization effort actually pertains to this. But the current effort also of localization tried also to strengthen the oversight function of the provincial government to lower levels of government, like the component cities and the municipalities within that particular province. That was also the aim. And the finding of the, the previous study of ours, 2019, was that this needed to be strengthened as well. Um, you have to get um, or align um, priorities with uh, lower levels of local government. So uh, let's go back to the Philippine Development Plan at the national level. So similarly, we also have the Philippine Investment Program, which shows you the um, prioritized programs, projects, and activities that helps bridge the gap to the vision in, envisioned in the Philippine Development Plan. Now, there are also regional investment programs, and here you can see that um, it's similar in that on occasion, uh, the lower level local governments would want to get uh, additional assistance or coordinated investments with higher level local governments and then with the regional government and so on and so forth. Now, the very interesting thing is that we have a five-year um, plan, but it has to get implemented in an annual budget. So there's a different um, time um, when it comes to the plan and the budget. So you have to divide your priorities across um, annual budgets and figure its way into the General Appropriations Act. Now, one interesting thing I'd like to, to, to note here is in terms of the annual investment program. So um, municipalities typically would have challenges in financing their prioritize programs and activities um, within their own budget. So pre, pre mandanas okay, the practice was either they would go to the provincial uh, government to get funding, or they would go to the Regional Development Council in order to get funding through national government agencies, or they would go directly to national government agencies to ask for additional funding through national government, local government unit support programs. And, um, and right now, it is still unclear as to whether this will be continued or discontinued in the implementation of the Mandanas ruling. So that's the, the end of the background. And I'd like to go on to the policy questions and objectives. This study was really straightforward because no one really has, as the DILG had asked us to do, has ever looked or summarized all of the information. Um, and that's the objective of this study, to, to, to see how it can be appreciated and used by national government oversight agencies. So the objective is to assess how recent PDP localization efforts to ensure the alignment of provincial NCR LGUs to national development goals fared. The policy question was how effective were recent PDP results, matrices, uh, localization efforts? Were the objectives of this met? Have these efforts resulted in aligned provincial city re regional matrices with regional development plan uh, results matrices? 
Can these be used to monitor progress and development in priority areas in each region? So we had a very simple methodology, mixed methods approach, sequential parallel analysis, desk review. We had key informant interviews and focus group discussions with both DILG field officers and LGUs, although these were all um, virtual. Uh, and then we also have this small case study using the PDP accomplishment reports because one of the, 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 the directives is that apart from drafting a results matrix, you have to also draft annual accomplishment reports, of course, to be able to monitor progress. Now, did LGUs comply with the PDP localization efforts? Yes, they did. 97.4% of provinces did, while 94.1% of NCR LGUs did. Now, let me give you the national summary. So this is the national summary. And let me share with you how this was actually um, drafted, okay? Uh, how we came up with the summary figure. So what we had was the provincial uh, results matrices, like I showed you earlier. And we had to code these and count these, okay? In some cases, uh, these were incompletely filled uh, by the provinces. So we had a challenge in summing up the average number of indicators, which is why later on we'll see, you, you can see there's a, there's a variation of indicators here. But at the same time, let's say for some of the chapters, let's say chapter eight on agriculture and fisheries, some of the indicators like increased, increased uh, product, or um, increased per crop. Um, the results matrices drafted by some of the LGUs, like in the case of CAR, and I think it's also region eight, they identified the target per crop, which is very detailed information. That's why we have um, big numbers right here in the average number of indicators. So, so we did the summary by the provincial level, and then we summed across the regions but we got the average instead so that we wouldn't get such a huge number. So it was the average, I'm presenting you, the average number of indicators by region. So it's divided by the number of provinces because you can imagine how large this data set was. And it was a challenge to um, try and remove for duplications. But, but this, is, um, this gives you a, a good picture, a pretty good picture. Since this is the first crack at this data, it gives you a pretty good picture as to the priorities and the availabilities of, let's say, indicators, um, those aligned with social, uh, sustainable development goals, those that have baseline information, which is very important, and those that have targets, which is very important also because it shows a commitment. And you, we will see later on that there are fewer indicators with targets than baseline information. So if you take a look here, the average below here, excluding NCR, so we excluded NCR uh, typically because it would skew the distribution. Per region, there would be about 340 um, in average indicators, and 37% of these are aligned with sustainable development goals. So we just match. Um, we based it on the, the, the table where the, the results matrix where the provinces were asked to identify which were aligned with sustainable development goals. So about 37% of these were aligned with sustainable development goals. 82% um, of the reported indicators had baseline information. I'm sorry, this should be percentage um, there. Uh, and then 67% of these um, indicators did have targets. So that's the national summary for you here. Now let's take a look at the regions, okay? So for the region, let's say region three, okay? Region three had an average of 181 reported indicators. Okay, 52% of these were aligned with sustainable development goals. 78% of these had baseline data and 61% of these had targets. So this is very interesting. The top three PDP chapters in for region three were chapter 10, human capital development, chapter eight, agriculture and fisheries, and chapter three, vulnerability of individuals and families reduced. So this is tied also with chapter 20, ecological integrity. Now the top three SDG aligned indicators were human capital development, uh, ecological integrity, and sustainable infrastructure facilities and services. Now with the most number of baseline and target data, which were the chapters, human capital development, agriculture and fisheries, and sustainable infrastructure facilities and services. So that's how region three. So so if you go through the discussion paper, you'll see that the different regions have differing priorities. Um, in the case of NCR, so let me show you because this shows you the, how, how I mentioned at the beginning that uh, different localities would have different priorities. So an average of 106 reported indicators in the case of NCR, 
10% of these were aligned with SDGs, 96% have baseline data, and 66% with targets. Okay, so the top three PDP chapters were, curiously enough, Chapter 8, Agriculture and Fisheries, um, and then there was Chapter 7, Philippine Culture and Values Promoted. So this is unique. Um, this has not appeared in any of the other chap uh, other regions, if I'm not mistaken. And Chapter 5 would be People-Centered, Clean, Efficient, and Effective Governance Ensured. So I think this would be expected, especially here in the National Capital Region, where we're very vocal about um, improved governance. Now, the, in the top three with SDG-aligned indicators would be Chapter 8, Agriculture, Fisheries, Chapter 7, Philippine Cultures, uh, Culture and Values Promoted, and Industry and Services Expanded. The, the indicators with the most number of baseline and target data would be for culture and values, uh, agriculture, and people-centered, clean, efficient, and effective governance. Now, let's take a look at the case study where we examined the PDP results matrix accomplishment reports for monitoring. So in 2018, after drafting the RMs, uh, the DILG and the, um, and the NEDA were uh, asked the local governments, the provinces, to, to draft an accomplishment report, both for 2018 and 2019. So, so that's the purpose of this, this case study is to show how the drafted RMs can be used for monitoring. Now, of the 90 provinces in NCRLGUs that drafted an RM, those that submitted accomplishment reports were only 44 in 2018 and 37 in 2019. Now, we looked at provinces of regions 1 and 10. Why? Because we wanted the province uh, regions that had provinces which submitted for both years, 2018 and 2019, so we could see how we could compare it. Now, region 1 and region 10 accomplishments a summary. So we see here that different provinces and consequently regions have different priority areas. These provinces are also performed differently in terms of achieving their targets. So here in the first column, you see region one and region 10 in the second column. Um, they have different top priority. For region one, it's human capital development. For region 10, it's uh, vulnerable individuals and families. But they both have agriculture and fisheries in their top three, okay? Now, in the case of Region 1, all provinces submitted accomplishment reports for both years. Uh, region 10, only two of five submitted. Uh, in Region 1, Tongasenan was the only province that improved in hitting targets from 2018 to 2019. Uh, in Region 10, only one of the five provinces submitted accomplishment reports for both years. Now, the case study, uh, let's, say, let's take a look at Tongasenan accomplishments. So this was all from the, the summary matrix that we, we, we drafted. So there was an improvement in overall uh, results matrix accomplishments from 8% of indicators in 2018 to 14% in 2019. Now accomplishments were in these areas, agriculture and fisheries, human capital, gains from demographic divide, sustainable infrastructure. And of the reported accomplishments, those that reached targets were higher in 2019 at 74% compared to only 55% in 2018. For Lanao del Norte's accomplishments, there was a decline in overall accomplishments from 57% of indicators in 2018 to 34% in 2019. Now, the accomplishments were in agriculture and fisheries, vulnerability of individuals and families reduced, and sustainable infrastructure. Now, of the reported accomplishments, those that reached targets were higher at, in 2019 at 51%, compared to only 35% in 2018. So, uh, the proportion of targets that were reached in 2019 was higher, although the, the number of the proportion of indicators that were accomplished was lower. Okay. Now, for the key interview, informant interview results, this one, the objective was to get the perspectives of those who had implemented this at the level, which is why I'm very happy that Ms. President uh, Nidas is, is with us. Um, we talked with both uh, those at the DILG, regional local government offices, as well as those at the LGU level. Now, overall, um, well, of those that we had interviewed, majority of key informant interviews, uh, in informants interviewed from both LGU and DILG believe in the relevance of creating this and their usefulness in identifying and clearly defining priority areas for investment as well as monitoring and evaluating progress. Though implementation was initiated by the DILG NEDA through the conduct of regional workshops, some provincial governments conducted their own workshops, including lower-level LGUs. 
Now, for some provinces, lower le level LGUs were given the opportunity to give input. So they were distributed with forms that they could accomplish ahead of time before the workshop. Um, but uh, they, the, there were cases where in the lower level LGUs did not submit any inputs to the drafting uh, for the drafting of the results matrices. Now, human resources was also one major concern in this exercise. So there was talk of lack of manpower. So there is a need to assign someone to do this task, localization. Um, there's also lack of technical capacity um, raised by the um, those that we interviewed. And um, there was also a suggestion from one of those in the local government that to, to make it easier to minimize the efforts of local government officers to make uh, results matrices codes consistent with the annual investment plan codes because they are already familiar with this. If this um, initiative to be, would be continued. Now, the concern of the exercise of some of the local government units was that this was encroaching on local fiscal autonomy. Um, it's perceived as an exercise that requires that saying to LGU, say you have to prioritize this. However, um, this could also be in the messaging and it's part of the recommendations later on, that it's not so much as uh, imposing the priorities of the national government, but, but trying to elicit from the local governments what they um, prioritize in the own local governments and how they can contribute to national development. So the general findings, the PDP localization effort was well received and is believed to be a useful tool in identifying priority areas of LGUs and their contribution to national development. There is a demand from LGU officials that implemented this itself to institutionalize and integrate this as part of the development planning process. Now, the RMs could show areas where technical capacity building and budgetary support could be given to local governments. And um, there is a need, though, to ensure the correct completion of the results matrices in order to be able to um, have correct assessments. Now, what are the recommendations? First, to institutionalize the drafting of results matrices with local development planning. Uh, this, there should be a strengthened linkage between planning, let's say the results matrices, and the investment programming, local development investment program, budgeting outputs and outcomes. And this was raised when we presented this to our principals, uh, the TILG, DBM was there also, and the NEDA. And they said that um, there should be a way to trace what is in the plan and how much is allocated to it, and what, in order to be able to define what, out, what outputs and outcomes, more importantly, it contributes to. And right now, there's a current effort at the BLGD at the DILG to um, create codes for the results matrices and to eventually perhaps maybe align them with the AIP. Um, but this is still being developed right now, um, as well as there are efforts to have an ELDIP, so doing it online. So that would make summarizing all of the information that we did so much easier. Now also on institutionalization, there's a need to enhance capacities to facilitate accurate compliance. Okay. The second main recommendation is to, to ensure that data is available. So for some LGUs that we interviewed, they already had established data systems that they drafted their ecological profiles on. But it's important that other to note that other LGUs had challenges in, in having data and data accessibility. So perhaps also efforts of this should be aligned with the CBMS Act that is also um, prioritizes the um, um, the construction of databases, especially for the poor uh, LGUs. Now, also under ensuring data to establish management information system where data will be um, input and summarized. Okay, and lastly, to improve the information and education campaign to highlight that this is the local government unit's contribution to national development, not so much as an imposition by the national de government as to what they should do. So uh, I end there. Thank you very much. I I went a bit over time, but thank you, Sheila. <laughs>